Hi, Peter Charles here for Fly Fly Fishing. And during my last video on fishing streamers, I received a comment uh, talking about adding weight to our hooks and adding weight to our streamers and the effect that weight has on the fly. And I thought, you know, that's a good subject for a video. So here it is, and I'm going to get into the effects of weight on the flies. Get a little bit techy at times. I apologize for that, but hey, I'm a fishing nerd. Okay, I can't help myself. Um, the one thing I have to say, with if you're adding weight to flies and you're, you know, you're just maybe following a pattern or you're just putting something together, don't just throw weight on a hook. You have to think about its placement. You have to think about how much. Uh, you have to think about what it's going to do to the way the fly swims. You also have to think of what kind of hook you're putting it on because the nature of the hook will change how that fly performs with that weight added. So let's get into that and talk about adding weight to flies and having them swim properly because that's really what it has to do in the end. The first thing I like to talk about is dealing with something called center gravity and toe angle. Basically, that when we tow a fly through the water, well, I get my black ghost here, and I grab the wing and the tail, and I pull on this on my uh, line, you'll see that that fly goes a little nose up. And that's because it's tied on a down eye hook. And it will sag quite badly in a slow current like that, if you're, if you're pulling this through a slow current. And if I hang this vertically, well, let's see, move it over here on part of my shirt where you can see it clearly. If I hang that vertically, you see it hangs straight down, right down from the line, all the way straight down. There is no uh, angle to it at all. And that's telling you that that line is going right through the center of gravity of that fly. If that hook was at an angle, any kind of angle, it would tell you that the center of gravity was somewhere else other than directly below the uh, the pull of the, the line, the pull of the leader. And if you've not encountered the issue of center gravity before, it's a very simple concept. It's the point in an object, any object, where the force of gravity or the force of any, what we call a vector, like a, a push, for example, would act. And, and a perfect example is if I'm going to push a chair with one hand across the floor, I have to push the middle of the chair and the chair will go straight across the floor. But if I pushed one side, the chair would start to spin and it wouldn't go in the right direction. And that's because my, the force of my hand was not through the center of gravity. If I align it with the center of gravity, it will push straight. If I line it to one side, it spins. If I do too high, it might tip over. So keeping the center of gravity or knowing roughly where it is on a fly and where the pull of the leader will intersect with the center of gravity tells you how that fly will ride in the water. And also will tell you whether it will ride correctly, ride upside down, ride on its side. I mean, these are all the things that can happen if we don't put a little bit of thought to the fly ahead of time. So let's look at some, some of the flies. I've got a bunch of flies here. So let's look at some flies that I've added weight to. And I've got my headstander fly here. Now, this beastie is tied on a jig hook, and it's got heavy lead eyes, and it has a big rabbit wing. And when this thing is in water, if, I, if there's not much current, it'll stand almost straight up on the head. So it will, it will actually be in the water like that. And it's because rabbit traps air and is buoyant and you've got that big heavy wing. Now, I've got my headstander on a line, and I'll pull it, and look at the down angle on that fly. I mean, that thing is going nose down. So, when I pull this through the water, guess what's happening to it? Straight down. So, the fact that I've used clouser eyes and a jig hook, I've created a fly that will really nose down when I apply pressure to it in the water by pulling it through, either stripping it or swinging it in the current. And when I back off the tension, it just drops like a rock. So that's a, a, an op, a example of strategically using weight and style of hook. I have the jig hook, as you can see, uh, heavy lead eyes, and it's a heavy shank hook. It's a two extra, at least a two extra heavy hook. Uh, and yet it works just fine. 
So let's look at an example that went bad on me. Okay, similar hook, uh, slightly smaller. And I put a bead on it. And I wanted that uh, fly to ride hook point up. And you look at that and you go, yeah, that'll work. No, I didn't. It rode hook point down sort of a little bit on its side. The bead was too light. And it could not counteract the weight of the gape. So instead of coming through the water point up like that, which is what I was after, it kind of went the reverse. It kind of went something like this. It was pretty awful. And it didn't look natural at all. Needless to say, I haven't caught a single fish on this thing. Um, I tell like four or five of them. If I'd put a heavier bead that caused the center gravity to shift on this fly, it would have rode point up and I would have had a problem. But because the bead was too light, it didn't ride properly. Another example is where we put a cone head on a woolly bugger, on a down eye hook. And you can see this is like a, um, a size six, I think, uh, four extra long streamer hook. Small gape, all right? There's not a lot of wire there. And I have a down eye hook here. So small gape, down eye hook, big brass bead. I can get into trouble with this because the gape is small. That woolly bugger can ride on its side. Instead of riding upright, it can go on its side. It can do, look a little strange in the water on its side. It won't fish quite as well. So that was a case of me using a hook with a small gape and a heavy cone. If I'd used a lighter cone or a, a bigger gape hook, no problems. If I'd used uh, what they call a specimen eye or straight eye, like um, this clouser with this straight eye, that wouldn't have been a problem either. But because I used a down eye hook, small gape, and a fairly heavy brass cone, I ran into trouble with some of those flies, and all it took was a slight inaccuracy in how I wound the hackle on, and it's all over the place, and didn't look good at all. So you have to consider uh, some things here. How heavy is the weight we're adding? Where are we adding it? On top of the shank, underneath the shank, or is it central to the shank? Up eye, down eye, straight eye, big gape, small gape. All these things impact how the fly swims. So for example, in my little saltwater clouser here, I've got a short shank, very heavy gauge hook. This is a tarpon hook. Specimen eye, big clouser eyes. This fly rides beautiful, no problem at all. And uh, it planes down nicely in the water, it holds well when you hook up a fish, nothing wrong with it at all. Everything balances out. Because I was using this very heavy tarpon hook, I made sure the eyes were big and heavy to counteract it. Otherwise, this also would have been rolling. If you ever use a clouser that rolls, it's probably because your eyes are too small for the size of the hook you're using. So it has to be proportionate. Let's look at another clouser. Okay, this one has small eyes, but the hook is a relatively small hook as well. It's not a big gape hook. And I've tied all of the material, as you can see, on top of the hook. It's bucktail. The bucktail doesn't, this is the bucktail from the tip of the bucktail, which is solid. So it does sink, but it's a slow sinking material relative to the rest of the fly. So as a consequence, this fly, despite the light, small eyes, this fly rides properly. So by putting all of the material on top and using material that is just slightly negatively buoyant, um, I'm able to get a fly that rides properly. So one of the things I think that's really important, that when you're working with relatively light weight and you want the points up and you're building a clouser style fly and you're using a, not a lot of weight, Make sure you keep the gape small and use a, a down eye hook because which when flipped upside down becomes an up eye hook. And you get the advantage of this thing will plane down in current a little bit. It will go down. When I pull it, it goes down just a little bit and it helps to get the fly down. So if you have a fly that will is constructed to plane down because of the, the type of hook you're using and where you've positioned the weight, you don't have to add as much weight to get it down. So it becomes easier to cast. That's a nice thing to think about, isn't it? 
Now I'm going to introduce you to a really interesting fly. This one's caught a bunch of fish. It's kind of beaten up. It's got some rust on it. You know, it's well used, so forgive the appearance. But um, this is tied on another streamer hook, another size 6. As you can see, it has a brass uh, cone head, and it has some rubber legs, a thick body, have a rabbit wing. Now, what's significant about this fly, not only does it have this brass cone here, but the uh, sh about half the shank is covered in lead. I've wrapped it in lead. It's very heavy. Now, what's important about this, being a down-eye hook designed to ride with the point up, the toe angle is above the center of gravity. And that's the key point with putting weight on a fly. Whether your fly is designed to ride hook point down or hook point up, it doesn't matter. This, the pull or toe angle has to be above the center of gravity for it to ride correctly. If you have a center of gravity that is above your toe angle, you have it will flip at least on its side, maybe even upside down. If your center of gravity and your pull angle are, are closely aligned, then it can get very twitchy whether it rides upright. A slight inaccuracy in how you put the materials on could cause it to roll over. So by using a down eye hook, which is up eye in this position, and lots of weight here, so the center of gravity is on the shank of the hook. And then, to top it off, I used rabbit, which is buoyant. It traps air when you cast. So I've got a buoyant wing. So this thing will ride hook point up, despite not being a clouser. Despite not having eyes underneath the shank of the hook, this thing rides hook point up reliably. So you can get a fly like this without clouser eyes, which I did not want to use because being a goby pattern, I wanted a drag bottom. I didn't want clouser eyes that would easily snag up on rocks. I wanted a cone head. But by using this down eye hook, which is now becomes up eye when it's upside down, rabbit wing for buoyancy, and all that lead, I got a fly that rides reliably hook point up all of the time. So let's look at all the elements that go together to make this work. You have to have the center of gravity, you know, and your toe angle aligned in such a way that the center of gravity is below the toe angle. Otherwise, the thing will flip over. It always wants to have the center of gravity below it. That's why clouser eyes work. That's why you can put clouser eyes under a hook and have the thing ride hook point up. You also want to make sure that you're choosing a hook that will allow you to do that. So if you're choosing an up eye, a down eye, or a straight eye, think of how it's going to ride, think of that toe angle, and how it will, how the force of your pulling on the leader will go through the fly, through the center of gravity, and what it will do to it. Will it flip over? Use buoyant or less dense material to help with the orientation. You know, like this particular fly here. I've got light wings on it, uh, sorry, light eyes on it, so uh, it could start to flip a little bit, but then I put all of that bucktail on top of the shank, so now the bucktail is going to guarantee this thing's going to ride properly. So you can help your case by putting on the right kind of material. Put your dense material on the bottom of the fly and put your less dense material on the top of the fly will help with the, uh, the way the fly rides as well. So keep all those things in mind. Just don't slap weight on it. The last thing I might add, and this is just a little extra. You can see I've got a loop knot on this uh, fly. I just tied this in a hurry. It's not a good loop knot. This was tied for the video. But you can see that this allows the fly, when I put it in the water, it allows the fly to go straight nose down. The leader is not trying to pull the fly in this way. way. It will... Choom, it will just go straight down because the leader is not impacting the way the nose of the fly is going down. So if you want maximum depth, always use a loop knot. And your flies will orient nose down and will plunge like rocks. Uh, if you're using a really skinny leader, uh, probably won't hurt if you don't use a loop knot. But if you're using a relatively thick leader, 
you know, 12 pound, 15 pound, something like that, I would use a loop knot for sure to give you that kind of mobility. Also, you get a better movement too. If you're using a heavy um, tippet, you'll get better movement out of the fly if you're using a loop knot. So give all those things a thought when you're putting your flies together. Just don't slap weight on a hook. Think about where that weight's located, how much you're putting on, how is it related to the size of the gape and the gauge of the wire, whether it's extra heavy hook or a standard wire hook, and think of the materials you're putting on. When you put all that together, you'll get a fly that swims properly. If you don't put it together right, well, you can get a fly that's doing all sorts of stuff and doesn't catch any fish. So there it is, adding weight to a fly. Cheers.